and move and have our very being. Amen. All right, let's start. We're training our souls for his joy.
Let's pray. God, we thank you for today, and we thank you for what you're doing. Lord, may our focus be on you today and not the things that can distract us, or maybe our week that we had or the week we're facing. Lord, may we give this moment to you and do a work in our hearts. God, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I, I, we just sang about trading our sorrows for the joy of the Lord. So the scripture I want to read is Psalms 5, 11, 12. But let them all be glad, those who turn aside to hide themselves in you. May they keep shouting for joy forever. Overshadow them with your presence as they sing and rejoice. Then every lover of your name will then burst forth with endless joy. Lord, how wonderfully you bless the righteous. Your favor wraps around each one and covers them under your canopy of kindness and joy. Hallelujah. Amen. Hey, there's two. We're going to <laughs> be joyful Yay. no matter what is going on around us. We can be joyful. He covers us with his love.
unstoppable Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes. We bless your name. stand before you now, the grace of your renown, I have heard of the mighty and wonder of you, King of heaven, in humility. I'll be over here if anybody needs some prayer during the next song. We like to just be able to lift people up. And uh, so during the song, come on over here and we'll pray for you and see what God does. Amen. Jesus. 
lives and Lord I thank you for you know we serve a big God All right, let's just, let's just take a moment and not get distracted by when things don't work and let's just raise hands and let's just worship in our own words. Lord, we thank you for what you've done in our lives. We thank you for, uh, for saving us. We thank you for forgiving us from our sins and, and God helping us walk and live and just be the people you've called us to be. Now, Lord... I am so awed by what you're doing in lives in this place. I've seen so much growth. It is so exciting. And Lord, I'm so excited for the future that you have here of what you're, what you're going to do. Amen. Now, Lord, come down and be present with us. There's not a large number of us, Lord, but we're here because we love you. Amen. And Lord, we want to grow in you. We, wanna, we want to learn how to live our lives in such a way that those around us want to follow the same Savior we're following. We don't want people to follow us. We want people to follow you, Lord. And so help us live those lives. Now be in the service. Touch us. Um, work in us. Change us. God, anoint the words that I'm going to say in my own weakness. God, you be strong. And we thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Take a moment. Greet one another. Before
together we're having so much fun I I always love when a $300 mic dies and they're not repairable because what breaks is this little wire right here and this thing is so thin that it's just like I mean it's it's really comfortable to wear They have a short, a short life. They always choose to die during prayer or during something really important. Or I mean, they never die during announcements or be friendly time or any of that. They always die, you know, at just the wrong moment. That does lead me to believe that sound equipment, computer equipment, lights, all that stuff is slightly demonically possessed. I'm... I, I do remember um, way back in, oh my gosh, 1990, I, I pastored a small church and so to make a little additional money, I did networking for businesses in a small town and I actually did the police department in City Hall and I remember one time when I was working on the city manager's computer and Everyone at the city had tried to get it to work, and they couldn't, and so he called me in because I charged them quite a bit of money. And the more money you charge, the less often they call you in for stupid things. And, and so I was there fixing his computer, and I said, you know, sometimes there's a scripture that applies to this. Some of these things only come out through fasting and prayer. And the city manager looked at me and he goes, that's why I hire a preacher, because I know sometimes prayer is the... Last resort for computers, you know. <laughs> the, the bad part of that deal was the police department side because that was before cell phones. I know for some of you, you don't remember life before cell phones. Some of us do. Um, and I had a pager, but a small town, and I drove a black Audi 5000 with dark tinted windows that looked like the drug dealer's car. And I mean, you probably... <laughs> And um, I did get a good deal on it, but the police would just find me and pull me over and say, hey, we need you to come to the police station because we've got to book somebody and the computer's not working. And they couldn't book anybody without the computer. And that's really true today, too. I mean, it's, if the computer goes down, everything stops. It's, it's really, so I remember it was kind of funny. They'd pull me over. Okay, I guess they got priority on computer service. Um, all right, today first, Scott, why don't you come and do the offering? I believe that's the next thing that's queued up, right? Yeah. I'll let you know if it's starting to for me. I'm going to take a little moment of my time on it. <laughs> I appreciate that. 
since we're we're sharing them. I don't I don't do the sit down thing. Let's pray over the offering. Um, there's several different ways that we can give. There's an offering. Uh, I call it a bucket, but it's actually mounted on the wall back there um, for your offering this morning. We can also, <clears throat> excuse me, send it into the office, and they have a computer where you can actually do that online, which makes it really simple for some people, but for some of us others, it's a little more complicated. Once you enter the 84321, you enter all your information. Once it's logged in, it's set, then you just designate where the money goes and the amount, and it's all taken care of. <clears throat> you can also mail a check down to 805 Township or kind of do like we did. We have our account already set up with our bank. It, it comes out every payday. A certain percentage comes out and goes to the church, honestly, so that way we never see it. Um, but let's ask the Lord to bless our offering today. God, we thank you for the opportunity to give. Help us to remember that all good things come from you, our ability to work, to have a job, Everything comes from you, Lord, and you just ask for a little bit back so that you can multiply that in our life. Lord, help us to grab a hold of that, that we really only own 90%. Lord, help us not to uh, take from you, but to give unto you as what you need to do your work here in this church. Lord, bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. These are, yeah, I know. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and do the campus video. the campus video. Maybe louder. We have a ton of fun stuff coming up. Come on, let's check it out. Hi, ladies. I am so excited. We have a ladies' Bible study coming up September 27th, Monday nights at the Cedar Woolley campus, 6.30 p.m., and child care will be provided. For more information, please check us out on our website, or please come and see me, and let's talk about it. This is going to be a great time to grow and connect, and it's going to be free. See you there. Family night is back September 15th, and we're kicking it off with a pizza party. See you there. Hey, Inspire Church, we're going to be having a ministry conference on September 18th. This is an opportunity for you as a ministry leader or someone looking to get more involved in ministry across all of the Inspire Church campuses to come and learn. We're going to be talking about kids ministry, worship, greeting, all sorts of different breakouts. We would love to have you there. It's going to be the 18th of September from 9 to noon. And then the next day on the 19th, we're going to be having a Jersey and Cracker Jack Sunday. I don't care what team you support. I'm a big Ducks fan, which I know isn't that popular. Come to church wearing your favorite jersey. You're going to get some Cracker Jacks. It's going to be an excellent day. Can't wait to see you there. Inspire groups are coming back the week of September 19th. Sign up at icskagetvalley.org or in the church foyer. Coming September 26th is One Day to Feed the World. This is where we're asking everybody to bring one day's wages to donate to feed people through Convoy of Hope. I told you so. There's so many great things coming up. For more information, check us out on icskagetvalley.org. See you later. I would think that she's going to have some new ones pretty soon because she just got back from Disneyland. So... Um, she lives a rock throws from my house. So, yes. Yeah. We'll see, we'll see what we can do. Yeah. Yeah, we can arrange, we can arrange for that. Um, I think next Sunday, I'm actually going to do a, a sermon on shape. And it probably is the single thing I'm most passionate about in the church. Um, I may have some announcements about how we're going to do that and maybe something we're going to do right after church. I'll, I'll let you know. Um, but discovering our shape, I don't mean the shape that you see in the mirror because as I've gotten older, that shape ain't real pleasant. Um, I mean the shape of, of who we really are as a person you're, all of us have different abilities. Like some of you can sing, I can't. I would love to be able to sing. I would love to be able to sing well. It's just something I can't do. Um, I've, yeah, I've, some people have that skill. 
But the reality is we're all, we all have different skills. We all have different passions. Many times our passions are based on something that happened in our life. Uh, I had a very tough time in school because I was very ADHD. I was also very neglected by my parents. And so one of the reasons that I work in the public school is to try to help kids that may, have, may be struggling with some of the same problems I struggled with. I think that's what drives our life many yeah. times. The, the, the things that we've struggled with, the Lord's helped us get over, we want to help other people get over those things. And so that's different for all of us. Our, each of us have different personalities. Now, some personalities I've met are just annoying. I know there's a place for them in the kingdom of God someplace, but all of us have, all of us have our different personalities and our different um, experiences, and all of these things drive how the Lord's going to use us in ministry. And so next week, I'm going to talk about each of those areas. Um, probably going to do something. Maybe we'll do something right after church. I'll bring some pizza up, and we'll, we'll heat that up, and we'll, we'll do a little thing after church and, and maybe have a little fun with it and really do a little bit of discovery. Not just me preach to you about what shape means, but you actually do a little bit of stuff to discover what your shape is. Um, because once you know how you're shaped, it begins to make sense how the Lord's going to use you. And like they're talking about having a ministry conference down the hill or down the river. Um, the reality is what we're trying to do is, is every one of us are designed to do ministry. Every one of us are designed to serve the Lord in some way. Not all of you are going to be in the role that I'm in where I sit in front of a microphone and speak. Now, the funny thing is I got in trouble all the way through school because I talked too much. And hadn't changed, you're right. But I found, I found a job that my job is to talk with kids. I, in a church, my role is to talk with you. Um, some of you would never be comfortable standing up here and talking. Just it wouldn't be what you would want to do because it's not who you are. And I'm so happy for these people that come up here and play instruments and, and, and sing and and actually really work at that because that's who they are. And Nicole, back there doing all the electronics, that's who she is. And so I really do want to help you find exactly those roles and, and it'll help define for you. I would encourage you, invite some people. I will do a big thing on, on our um, feed that we send out on text messages and stuff. But invite, invite some people next Sunday because it's going to be fun. It'll be just be something you really, really enjoy. All right? Um, today, as I'm going to do our last in our messages about the road to recovery. And this, in, in some ways, is the hardest one I'm going to do. And I may actually go, I'm warning you, I may go a little off script. I'll give you all the fill-ins on this, but um, this is a super powerful message and I want you to understand that all of us are on a road to recovery. We talk a lot about drug addiction or alcohol addiction because those things are so, they're, they're kind of public things. They're kind of, um, a lot of people don't think people don't know that they're addicted to drugs, but everybody kind of does. Or they don't know that they're alcoholics, but everybody kind of does. But there's a lot of things we wrestle with sin-wise. And, and realistically, we're turning our sin over to the Lord, asking him to forgive us. And we're all on the road to recovery from, certain, from many different things. We're glad we don't have to stand up and admit what all the sins are the Lord's working on us on. Because some of them are embarrassing. But we're all kind of on this road to recovery. And so the last part of this is about recycling my pain. How I many know life is painful sometimes? Just, just honestly, life is painful. And there's a little bit of a belief that, well, if I come to the Lord 
and I get saved, that feels really good. And it's like, oh, this is going to be great. I'm not going to have any pain anymore. Can I share with you that's not true? That you give your heart to Jesus, it feels really good. There's a whole load lifted off of you, but it doesn't mean you're going to be pain-free for the rest of your life. I was really disappointed when I learned that. And so today I want to talk to you about, about that pain and why it's there and how the Lord uses it. So instead of covering it over and just saying, oh, the Lord's going to bless you, you're going to be all good, let me be honest. As you serve the Lord, you're going to have days that hurt. You're going to experience things that you're going to look to God and go, God, where are you? Why have you abandoned me? I would say most every Christian has, has made that statement to God in some way or another. God, why have you abandoned me? Where are you? What are you doing? I don't see you doing anything in my life. Nothing's going well. My life hurts. We all have those times. I don't like them. I interviewed for a job on, on Friday that I didn't get. I interviewed well. I thought I interviewed well. I guess they didn't think I interviewed well. Um, they hired somebody else. Actually, he's a friend of mine. And the way I found out I didn't get the job is my friend posted on Facebook that he got the job. That was painful. I like him, though, and he's a good guy. We're probably pretty similar. Probably interviewed pretty similar, too. But when I went into the interview, I knew there was a chance that I would fail. There was moments of frustration when I discovered that I had not gotten the job. As you can understand, it was about a $20,000 pay increase, which that would have been just fine. Um, but it's okay. There's some pain, but it's okay. But one of the things I said in the interview is I said, we all pray that God will help us grow. But truthfully, we grow better during hard times than we do during good times. When there's blessing all over and everything's going well, we don't do much growth. We just surf the wave. Growth happens when we crash. You know, that's when we have to grow. And so that's what this message is really about. Um, before we do that, though, I really want to um, pray for, for, for Scott. Scott's, um, Scott's gone through a, a tough few months here. Kind of started with me going to Hawaii. That caused the whole problem. <laughs> Scott got in a car wreck. Because he got in the car wreck, they took an x-ray. And because they took an x-ray, they discovered that he had some spots, places that he shouldn't have spots. And because he got in a car wreck and they took an x-ray and discovered spots, he went in and saw a doctor that they found these spots needed to be removed. And Scott got the spots removed. Never would have seen the spots if he hadn't gotten in the car wreck. I mean, he, I, he never would have found the spots that could have killed Scott if they hadn't have been found and, and removed. So you kind of go, yeah, that's, that's kind of where, it is kind of where you're at. And there, there was a book out when I was 16 or 17, my mom made me read by Merlin Carruthers called Prison to Praise. And it was an old book when you read it because it was new when I read it. But, and it's, but it's a great book because he really talks just about that kind of thing. That sometimes we look at things like this is the worst day of my life and God uses it to be the best day of your life. And Scott's car wreck, as horrible as it was and as painful as it was and how much it messed his life up, saved his life. Um, and so Scott's been going through some hard times. And I, I assume that, and Scott hasn't really said this, I assume that it's, it's massively affected your business and your livelihood. Um, I just assume that because you're... 
your one-man business. Um, and uh, he's had a lot going on in his family and some good, some good things, but some tough things at the same time. And so Scott's going to be leaving us and trying to figure out what God's doing in his life right now. How many know that's okay? We go through that. Um, we go through, we wander through the, the mountaintops that feel really good. We go down through the valleys that are some work. But sometimes we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And it's hard. But the Lord's present. And so, Scott, if you would come up and stand here, if I can get some of you to come up, let's lay hands on Scott and let's pray for him. He's been a, he's been a blessing to us. Oh, come over here and sit up. Right in the center. Right he's been a blessing to us, given a lot of his life and effort. And we just want to pray that God would do a miracle in him and to guide him in his life. Bless them, bless their family, and work powerfully on them. Lord God, I pray right now that you will just touch Scott and do a miracle in him. Continue the healing work in his body. Lord, as we get older, healing doesn't happen fast. So I pray you will work quickly in his body and bring wholeness again and bring strength and take the pain away. And God, you just do a miracle. Let him come out of this better than he's ever been. Lord, we, we believe that you are a miracle working and a healing God. So touch Scott right now in Jesus' name. I pray that you'll guide him, that you'll guide his passions, you'll guide his, his directions, that you will open his heart up to what you have for him. Lord, that as things may be changing for him, even though that may be scary, God, that would be exciting because, God, you're going to do a really neat thing in his life. Lord, I pray for his family. I don't know all the dynamics there, but, God, you know every situation. And I pray, God, that you will just do a miracle in his family. God, that you will draw them closer to you, that you will draw them all back into church, Amen. that you will, you will save them all, and you will just do a miracle work in Jesus' name. Help Scott and, and Christy be strong. Help them stay with your peace in their hearts and let them be the people that you call them to be. Oh, now, God, we thank you for how Scott has blessed us here. And we pray that, God, that you will direct his path and you will continue to bless him, that he would be a blessing to us. And that we believe that you can do this and you're going to do it. In Jesus' name. Amen. I use that example because I really think Scott is an example of this whole thing that sometimes the pain we go through, God uses really powerfully. All right, let's just do a little quick summary of recovery because that's what we've been talking about for the last several, several weeks. And that's really what Celebrate Recovery is going to do for us is to help people enter into this recovery cycle. Everyone doesn't go through it the same way. Some people respond really fast. Other people have to grind through it multiple times. Um, I mean, sometimes we're stubborn. Any of you stubborn? Um, yeah, it kind of is. <laughs> have you ever noticed the Lord doesn't allow, it works against your stubbornness? Gives you a clue. Um, I'm like the universe, yeah, I'll do my best. All right. So number one, realize I'm not God. Realize I'm not God. I admit I am powerless to control my tendency to do wrong, to do the wrong thing, and my life is unmanageable. This is such an important understanding is understand that, that I'm not God and I can't control everything. And I can't even control everything I do. Ever do anything you don't want to do? Ever tell yourself, I'm not going to do that because it's bad for me and you still do it anyway? And if you tell me, no, you don't do it, I'll tell you even Paul did. Because in Romans, Paul talks about it. He says, I, even do, the, I do the things I don't want to do. I set my heart on not doing things and I turn to go the other direction. I still end up doing those things. Because... We cannot manage our own life. We depend on God. And 
it's tied into the, the beatitude of happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Because mourning, this mourning is not mourning the dead. It's really talking about mourning sin. We mourn the sin in our lives. The sin in our lives breaks our heart, and it makes us sad. And we mourn that. Because we mourn that, the Lord will comfort us from that. Number two, earnestly, I just like that word, earnestly. Earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him, and that he has the power to help me recover. This is so important. Earnestly believe that God exists. We must hang on to that belief. Even if everyone tells us there is no God, and they'll say, look, there's COVID, and there's evil in the world, and there's bombings in Afghanistan, and there's all this bad stuff going on. How can there be a God? Can I show you that, that our God takes that evil and does good things out of it? And so earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him, and you matter to him no matter what you've done in your life. There is no wrong you can do that causes you not to matter to God. You cannot sin yourself away from his heart. He loves you to death. Literally. He loves you to the point he died for you. And he has the power to help us recover. If we'll fully turn our lives to him, God will help us recover. And that's happier than meek. Meek is a really hugely misunderstood word because actually it's an equestrian word. It comes from husbandry, the whole animal world. And it's this idea, think of a stallion that's never been ridden before. The strength of a stallion. How powerful they are. But when they aren't under control, when they aren't broken, they don't serve their owner very well. And so what does it take to break a stallion? I've been part of this process. And my girlfriend, when I was in high school, she tried the loving approach to breaking a horse. Her dad used the two by four. And basically, you would get on the horse, and if it tried to kick you off, Mr. Dry would hit the horse on the nose with a two by four. How many know that worked? I mean, <laughs> the combination of the love and the two by four kind of was a good deal, you know, a little bit of both. Yeah. How many know that's, but once the, once the stallion is broken and we can ride it and we can harness it and we can use its strength, the stallion is what is called, at that point, you call it meek. It's called meek because even though it's strong and powerful, it's under the control of its master. God wants us to be meek. He wants to break us so we're fully dependent and fully following him, but he doesn't want to take what our unique personality strengths are away from us. I don't like being broken. I like the loving approach better, but how many know it doesn't always work? Number three, consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. We choose to give our hearts to God. We choose to give all we are to God. We consciously make that decision to follow God. It says, happy are the pure in heart. For when we fully commit our heart to God and ask him to forgive our sins and fully commit our lives to Christ, our heart is made pure by Jesus. It actually tells us in scripture, he gives us a clean heart. He gives us a new heart. Next is openly, oh, I don't like this part. Openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, and to someone I trust. There's a process here of praying, God, show me my faults. Show me, show me where I sin. 
And as God shows us our faults, confess them and say, yes, God, you're right. I, I am. I'm struggling there. Help me. Forgive me. And the reason we say, first of all, we have to be honest with ourselves so we, we confess our faults to ourselves. Number two, we confess them to God and ask for forgiveness and ask for help. But number three, having someone you trust that's a strong friend in the Lord, when you confess your faults to them, they can help hold you accountable. And that's a good thing. Now, be careful. Don't just, don't just confess your faults to anybody. But have that person. Find that person. If you don't have that person, ask God that if he would give you that person that you can actually have that would be someone you can honestly talk to. Happy are those whose desire is to do what God requires. Happy are those whose desire is to do what God requires. When you desire to do God's will in your life, you will find happiness. Some Bibles will actually read, blessed is the person. I want you to understand, the word blessed directly translated means happy. Yes. Blessed and happy are the same words, except this isn't a surface happy. It's not a giggly happy. It's a deep, all the way to the middle of your core happy. Yes. When we're totally blessed. Right now, my daughter has gotten hired in, in Blaine. I don't know how much longer she'll be here because her, um, honestly, she was at work yesterday from 9 till 9. Um, when I woke her up this morning, she about killed me. Um, but she is so blessed at her job because she's in a job that is exactly what gifts she have. And they're asking her to do the things that she's passionate about doing. And she's happy to her core. See, that's what God does in our lives. Okay, next. Voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in my life. How many know sometimes we're stubborn and God tells us to change and we don't? Okay, what God's going to do is he's going to whisper. He's going to whisper. He's going to talk a little louder and eventually he's going to get the two by four out. Okay, uh, sometimes I wish I had listened to the first whisper. I've missed it a few times because I've experienced the two by four. Voluntarily submit. We'll be better off if we come to the Lord and say, God, I need your help. Help me change. And humbly ask him to remove my character defects. Do you understand this means admitting that we have character defects? How many of you have character defects? If you didn't raise your hand, you're lying. Okay, that's a character defect. <laughs> I remember I was at a John Maxwell conference, and he basically did something like this that said, said, all God's people have character defects. Look to your neighbor, tell them, I've got character defects. Tell your neighbor, neighbor they've got character defects. You know, because... Because we all do. And it starts with admitting that we have character defects and letting God bring change in our life. I don't like admitting I have character defects. I'd like to stand up here right now. And truthfully, back when I first started ministry, when I was in my 20, early 20s, I had a pastor tell me, as a minister, you never admit that you have a problem with sin because people need to have someone to look to as a model. I totally disagreed with that. Uh, because, right, Jesus is the model, not me. I, I'm a sinner. And I've given my heart to Jesus. I've followed him in ministry, but that doesn't mean I'm perfect and I'm not. And we all, are go, we all go through a journey together. And so... This idea that I first got taught was that pastors don't admit they have faults. That's silly, because we all do. Not just some, not just, to, not just those pastors that get caught in adultery or get caught in stealing from the church. All of us are human. We have faults. I don't, I don't, 
I don't ride to church with my wife. We learned very early in our ministry that we took separate cars to church because just as soon as we would get in the same car together, going to church together, we would get into it. And it's really hard to get into it with your wife right before you preach. And I don't know why she had to push all my buttons. It's all her fault. <laughs> yeah, you're just exactly right. I, I doubt it. I doubt it too. <laughs> but one of the things we learned is that was a good time not to be in a car together so that the devil couldn't intervene. Does that make sense? And so it, some of this is learning. Um, But there are, two, there are two beatitudes that cover this and a couple of the other ones. It says, happy are the merciful, happy are those that show mercy to others, and happy are the peacemakers. It's really funny how I could be a peacemaker in everybody else's life, but sometimes with my wife, I was everything but a peacemaker. Don't know how that worked. Um, but I've had to learn. I've had to learn to work on my character defects. We made 40 years. In August 1st was 40 years of being married. It was kind of a big deal to me because my parents were married 38 years. The last thing they did was come to our wedding together and they left in separate cars. And they divorced right after we got married. Dumbest thing they ever did. Um, caused them both a lot of heartache. But it was, it's was it been important to me to make it, that, that I'm not going to let my own character defects ruin a marriage that God ordained. Unfortunately, that means I have to ask God regularly to remove defects. All right. Next is evaluate all my relationships. This is tough. Evaluate all my relationships, offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me, and make amends for harm I've done to others. What this really means is that I have to figure out who's hurt me and I have to forgive them. I have to figure out who I've hurt and I have to go and try to fix that unless going to try to fix it would make it worse. And in some cases, in some cases it would. I have a few people that I can never go and fix it with. Um, they just, it would make it worse to try. But I think we need to be doing this on a fairly regular basis, evaluating our relationships. Next is reserve a daily time with God for self-examination. Bible reading, and prayer. Three things. Self-examination. In other words, this is the part where you look and say, God, where have I sinned against you today? Where did, where did I blow it? And as God reveals those things, ask forgiveness. And ask him to change you. And ask him to help you be better. And then Bible reading, because Bible reading is where you hear from God. Prayer is, is your talking to the Lord. Bible reading is really the place he talks to you. So if you want to hear from God, spend a little less time asking him for things and a little more time reading his word because that's how he talks to us. In order to know, the, know God and his will for my life and to gain the power to do it. So in other words, self-examination Bible reading, hearing from God, and prayer, talking to God, will help me figure out what God's doing and give me the power to do it in my life. And last is yield myself to God to be used to bring the good news to others by both my example and my words. Yield myself to God. I want to share what Jesus has done to the world by them seeing my life and them hearing my words. 
All right, number two. Why God allowed my pain? Why has God allowed my pain? Why is he... The, the question gets asked a lot. Um, why does God allow suffering in the world? Number one. He's given me a free will. He's given me a free will. I'm not a robot. God didn't create robots. God created people that had free will. We can choose to serve him or not. God did that on purpose. Because he wanted a people that would choose to serve him. Deuteronomy, is this the one that's wrong? Deuteronomy 11, 26, and 27 is what it really is. Okay. I'm giving you the choice between God's blessing or God's curse. There will be a blessing if you obey my commands. So God's given us a free will. How many know most of the pain and suffering I experience in my life is because of bad choices I make? I'm just honestly. Now, I'm not saying that all of us have had some pain because of bad choices other people make. But most of my pain is bad choices I make. I've done it to myself. And I know I've blamed God. God, why'd you let this happen? And God's going, well, I, it wouldn't have if you hadn't have opened your mouth up and said what you said or, you know, or whatever else, whatever you're particular sin tends to be, mine tends to be saying things I shouldn't, gets me in trouble all the time, because here's the deal, figure this out, my greatest strength is my ability to communicate God's word, my greatest weakness is my opening my mouth, two kind of go together, don't they, so God wants in my life to make my lips meek. He wants to break my lips so my lips will just serve him and not serve anything else. Each of us have our own struggles. Number two, why has God allowed my pain? He wants to get my attention. He wants to get my attention. And I'm going to say this, and I, I, I probably could look up and find a series of scripture for this. But guys, a week of pain now compared to eternity with the Lord is nothing. So suffering that we do in this life compared to eternity is nothing. It may feel big right now. When my wife was in labor about to give birth and she was in pain that felt like eternity for her at the time when she looks back on it it's different though that's how this will be sometimes it takes a painful situation to make us change our ways isn't that the truest thing I've said the entire sermon sometimes guys we tend to change because of pain we rarely change much when we're being blessed. When everything is going good, we don't make many changes. Because number one, we don't want to mess a good thing up. And so generally the pain is what causes us to, to change our life. I don't like no gain, no pain. You know? Okay, no pain, no gain. They both go together, right? When I used to play sports, the level I would work out at was intense. I swam about five miles every morning. I ran three or four miles every day. I was in the weight room an hour a day. I was absolutely completely committed because I was a college athlete. And I, I played at a very high level, and I was in very good shape, but there was a lot of pain to stay in that shape. I played soccer in, besides a year of college football, I played soccer, and I was 6'2 and weighed 235 to stay fast at 
a weight of 235 takes a lot of work. And it was painful. Since I quit playing sports, I gained a lot of weight because I had no motivation to avoid the two. Uh, you know, <laughs> Does that makes sense. I know none of you know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm glad, not because it hurt you, but because the pain turned you to God. I'm not glad that any of us go through pain. I'm glad when I see people turn their lives to God. And those two things are, are many times related. Most of us got saved because we were desperate. You know what I mean? We, we didn't get saved when, when it was going good. We got saved when it wasn't going good. And then we go to pray, God, oh, God, help me grow and improve in my life, but don't send me any pain. And the Lord goes, well, which do you really want? You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it, it really is there to get our attention. Number three, to teach me to depend on him. To teach me I can't do it on my own, I have to depend on God. God wants us dependent on him, not on ourselves. Because if we try to run, run on our own, we're going to mess it up. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 10 says, We were crushed and overwhelmed and saw how powerless we were to help ourselves. But that was good. For then we put everything into the hands of God who alone could save us, and he did help us. I had to do a, a funeral back when I was 22 or 23, the first funeral I ever did. Um, there were two girls in our youth group that got molested by their father. And... They reported it to me and to somebody else, and we called the police. And the police pursued the father, and the end result was the father ended up getting shot and killed. He pulled, a, he pulled an empty gun on the police and basically committed suicide by cop. Just before he did that, he went and saw a priest and spent several hours with the priest confessing his sins and asking God to forgive him. Do I know... Do I know where he went to after he died? I don't have a clue. Good news is that's not my job. Because if it were my call, I'd tell you where I'd send him. <laughs> However, I was talking with my pastor about what do I say in this funeral. Because I'd never dealt with a funeral that was that kind of suicide sort of kind of thing. That was kind of, how do you do this? And... And he said this amazing thing to me, and I've used it multiple times. He said, when someone leaves this life, they place themselves in the hands of God. Everyone that leaves this life places themselves in the hands of God. And you know what we know about the hands of God? They're loving, they're kind, they're merciful, they're also just. And God wants us all to be saved. He wants to be able to apply the blood of Jesus to your life. If at all he can, the blood of Jesus wants to cover our sins. We have to confess. We have to accept Jesus in our life. We have to ask him to forgive our sins. And God wants that to happen. God's not trying to make it hard for you to get in the kingdom. God's trying to get us all into the kingdom. And the good news is that every one of us will leave this life, go into the hands of God, and God's hands are much more capable of, of justly and lovingly determining where we go than, than our hands would ever be. I can tell you, those two young ladies are no longer young ladies. They're older ladies because <laughs> I'm getting old. <laughs> and I follow them on Facebook and they're happy and they're married they have kids and they're all serving the Lord and they're all doing well because even though they went through tremendous hardship as teenagers God powerfully blessed them Amen. and I've seen, the, I've seen God's hands work in their lives 
which has been very comforting to me. Psalm 119.71 says, It was the best thing that could have happened to me, for it taught me to pay attention to your laws. How many of you have ever been pulled over when you're speeding? Ever had the cop ask you how fast you were going? And here's the funny thing. Everybody lies. Yeah, I just, yeah, 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 why? I knew exactly how fast it's going. Because the moment you see the red light, you look at your speed off here, and you go, oh, no. You know what I mean? That's, that's it. I mean, I know exactly when that happens. Um, but the reality of that is if you ever, maybe you got a ticket, maybe you didn't, but when you drive away from that cop, you are following the speed limit for a certain amount of time. You know what I mean? For a certain amount of time, you are following the speed limit. It's horrible. <laughs> Can't get anywhere driving the speed limit. Um, but that's what happens when God gets our attention. Sometimes he whacks us upside the head, and all of a sudden, we, we bring it down, we slow it down, we start following his laws. And I mean, when we start following God's laws, we're, we're happier. We're more productive. And so sometimes God has to pull us over and write a ticket. And fourth, to give me a ministry to others. Why does God do this? So that when others are troubled, needing our sympathy and encouragement, we can pass on to them the same help and comfort God has given us. So we're able to help other people that are going through the pain we went through. And so that's the whole thing. Next week we talk about shape. It's, it's some of what we went through is going to drive what we do in the future. Because we're going to help other people that have gone through what we went through. Genesis 50, 20 says, they intended it to harm me, but God had intended it for good. I have had things happen to me that, that it looked like it harmed me, but in the end it was the best thing happened to me. I have lost some jobs that I felt God was unfair. I felt people were unfair. I was mad at people. I was mad at God. I was mad at my wife, the dog, myself. And I've looked up five years later and saw what, because of that, what happened to me, that God totally blessed me, that God was actually protecting me, that God needed to move me out of the way of the train and get me onto the solid ground. And I didn't like the move, but when I looked back, I saw the move was awesome. Does that make sense? I've lived long enough now that, that some of the hardest things that happened in my life, some of the things that have been the toughest, have actually in the long run been the best. And now I can share that with others. <clears throat> Number three, how to use my pain to help others. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to give an account to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. We need to be always willing to share about what God's done in our lives. Not be embarrassed about the mistakes we've made, but, but be positive about how God bailed us out. Always be able to do that with gentleness and kindness anytime someone asks. There's a step, and we will do it later this year, where we will work on writing our testimonies out, and we will work on, on working on, on getting so we can share our testimonies of what God has done. And this got me in real trouble in another church. Uh, many times we write those testimonies out. We do it in all these Christian terms. Then we need to rewrite our testimonies and put them into terms that the unsaved person will understand. We don't need to talk about sanctification, justification, and the, and the glory of the blood of Jesus. Because people that don't know the Lord don't understand those things. But we need to be explain what God has done in our life in a way that we can share our faith with others effectively. And you know what? Pain is going to be mentioned there. Difficult points in our life are going to be mentioned in our testimony because they're who I am. It's how I got saved. If I hadn't gotten kicked out of fifth grade, if I hadn't gotten kicked out of a school, I probably never would have given my heart to Jesus. 
But because that happened, I ended up at a church as a very broken fifth grade boy ready to receive. And so I didn't get kicked out of school because the school was a jerk. They were. But I got kicked out of school because I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I got kicked out of school because I called my teacher a communist. Fifth graders probably shouldn't stand up in class and call their teachers communist. Gray, you'll appreciate this. He was. <laughs> um, but everything that crosses your mind, you shouldn't say. Yeah, they are. And, and some things are much better handled privately or gently. Or, and I didn't have any of those skills. I just said what I, if it popped in my head, I said it. Got me in trouble. <laughs> and, you know, the, but the reality is that trouble it got me in led me to being saved. Glory to God. Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, If someone is overcome by some sin, Humbly help him back onto the right path. It doesn't say beat him over the head, thump him, be mean to him. It says humbly because you know what? We've all had, we've all had sin too. Humbly. Put our arm around him and say, hey, I want to help you back onto the path. Remember the next time it might be you who's in the wrong. That is so important to remember. Remember next time it might be you. It could be me that one of you is having to put the arms around and say, hey, pastor, you really shouldn't have done that. It'll probably be, pastor, you really shouldn't have said that. That'll be what gets me in trouble, what I say. Share each other's troubles and problems and so obey our Lord's commands. By share, we mean put our arms around each other. Not share them publicly. I'm going to go tell Shannon everything you've done wrong. I'm going to go tell the whole world. That's not the kind of share. Share means I put my arm around Shannon and we say to walk through life together. We share it. We share the weight of it. You know, when a player is hurt on the football field, generally two of us that are bigger than he is goes out on the field and puts our arms around him so he didn't have to put any weight on his legs as we walk him off the field. That's how we share is we pick up the weaker brother when they're weaker. Three little points here. Be humble. Be humble. Folks, humility and brokenness kind of go together. When you start feeling like you're better than everybody else, that means you checked humbleness at the door. And you need to ask God to forgive you and you need to get back in line. None of us are better than one another. We are all sinners saved by grace. You need to remember that. Number two, be real. I'm being as real as I can with you about my own weaknesses. I think being real is important. Really being honest about where we struggle. Number three, I don't have this one down yet. Don't lecture. <laughs> Don't lecture. Because lecture is, I'm trying to talk to you right now, and I kind of like sitting on the stool. The stool helps my back, but I don't, I can stand the whole sermon long, okay? But I kind of like sitting with you because it means I'm not lecturing you. Because lecturing is me talking to Shannon like this. And I'm sorry, I'll talk really loud. But the right way to do it is like this. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, and so we shouldn't lecture each other. We should humbly draw, humbly draw to each other so that we can communicate and share because you know what? None of us is over one another. None of us is better than one another. We're all sinners. We're all sinners. Finally, Acts 20:24. 20, says, but life is worth nothing unless I use it for doing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. What is the work that Jesus is assigning me to do? That's why we're going to do shape next week. So we can start discovering. What is it that God's asking me to do? 
the work of telling others the good news about God's mighty kindness and love. Ultimately, all of us are called to share the grace of Jesus with other people, but all of us are going to do it differently. And you know, the interesting thing is you're not always going to do it the same way. Scott, you're going through a change in your life right now. I don't know what God has for you. I've tried to pray, but God, God hasn't shown me exactly the role you're going to have, but he may never show me, but he needs, who, who he needs to show us? Scott. As we go through life, we have different seasons. And, and during one season, we may be called to do one thing. And then during another season, we may be called to do another. But you're going to find out they all fit who you are. They'll all line up with the pain that you've suffered and the victories you've had. Um, one of my better friends lost a child that was five years old. He had cancer. I had to be in there when we turned the machine off. And he breathed his last breath. That was a horrible thing they had to go through. But they have been able to minister to others that have gone through the same thing in a way that I never could. Amen. They've, they've gone through something I haven't gone through. Therefore, they have the grace to help other people in a way I never could. That applies to all of us. We've all been through some things that nobody else has. And God's going to use us. Those hard things we've been through and we've found victory over, God's going to use those things to help us help others. Gray recently lost his wife. And my heart breaks for you. I can't imagine I really mean that. But I also know God's going to use that. Gray's going to be able to touch some people powerfully because of what he's been through. And Gray, I never told you how blessed I was listening to the things that were said at your, your wife's memorial service, listening to some of your family talk and some of the friends talk about your wife and, and see the the blessing that they were, but know the blessing that they're going to be because of what they've been through. Yeah. All of you have been through different pains, different hard things. God's going to use those things for his glory. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the pain. I don't like it. Don't like pain. I like joy, happiness, and blessing. I don't like pain and tough stuff and having to confess sin and having to say I'm sorry and, and all that stuff. I don't like it, but Lord, I thank you for it because that's where we grow. Lord, I like the mountaintop. I don't like the valley. But Lord, the mountaintop's for celebration. The valley's where we grow stuff. Now, God, help us grow stuff. Lord, I pray that you would help everyone in this, in this room commit themselves to growing through the hard stuff and being the people you've called us to be to share your love and your grace with others. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just examining your heart, you'd simply say, Pastor, I want to learn how to use the hard stuff that's happened in my life to be a blessing to others. If that's you, I want you to slip a hand up because I want to pray for you. I want to use the hard stuff in my life to be a blessing to others. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord, I just pray for every one of these right now. I just pray for each one that has lifted a hand up that you would, that you would help them this morning. Really be honest about the tough stuff in their life. But help them learn to use that tough stuff for your kingdom. God bless us. Use us. Open doors for us. And we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Let's all stand. Lord, I thank you for what you've done today.
and what you're doing in our hearts. And I just pray, Lord, that you will continue to work in us as a church. Continue to grow us. Lord, I pray for Scott. Once again, as this is the last day with us. I pray you'll bless him, direct him, guide him, direct his family. Do some miracle work there. Now, Lord, bless this cake that we're going to eat in just a moment. Take the calories out. And we thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have some cake. If I could get someone that would go cut it and serve it. We have some cake to say thank you to Scott. So, Scott, you get to eat first, by the way. <laughs>